There I am. I'm so sorry. I'm fixing my mic stand. I was hoping Chris was going to pray longer. I got caught right here. <laughs> Can I keep going? <laughs> What's up, you guys? Hey, my name's John Roos, and I'm fixing my, my music stand. Um, no, it's good to see you guys. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about next weekend. I think I'm super excited to tell you guys what you did in 2019 in this church. It's really been amazing, just the giving and, and just, oh, man, it's been an awesome year. But I want to jump in today's message, so let's go ahead and, and dive in. If you have a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. It takes a holiday and a men's retreat to give us some room in this building, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. And do, as Chris said, do pray for us. We're meeting with a fire marshal, I think Thursday. I should know. I think it's Thursday. And uh, yeah, he's moving fast, so I'm pretty excited about that. But Philippians chapter 2, we do got some Bibles down here. If you don't have a Bible, you guys, German Bibles, ESV Bibles, um, which is the version I'm using, or swipe in your phone, but get the Philippians 2, and I'll meet you there. Now, uh, we have a men's retreat going on, so if one of your, if your husband, I almost said one of your husbands, if your husband, <laughs> that was not good, um, is gone, I'm talking about relationships today, take a ton of notes, and when he comes home, just preach at him. <laughs> it's going to be a really good strategy for you. Tell him you made it all up yourself from the Bible, too. It would be great. Um, but I do want to talk about relationships today. We're in this series called The Good News. And it was birthed because I, I just get tired of reading all the bad news, um, you know, through our news feeds, on our phones and all that. And I'm just like, man, there's so much good news that we can talk about. So I want to wrap up this journey, and then we're going to start a whole new journey next Sunday. It's going to be so good. But I want to talk today about the good news, division to peace. And that really is the design of the gospel, to take our relationships from division to peace. Now, don't raise your hand, but do throw an elbow if the person who needs help is next to you. How many of you guys need some relational help this morning? I just, okay, all right. Someone's not even ashamed. They're just like, bam! <laughs> right there, right there. Well, I, knew, I, I, I know I do. We all do. Relationships are not easy. And, and really, and specifically, here's what I want to talk about. So take a picture of this or write this down. I want to talk about, again, how the gospel heals relationships. And that is very encouraging to me. That's very exciting to me uh, to begin that process with you. How the gospel heals relationships. And the gospel is designed to heal two relationships, isn't it? What's the first one? Come on now. Okay, good. You guys said our relationship with God. That's why Jesus Christ died. That's why he rose from the dead. To bring us back to God. If you're, if you're a Christ follower, if you've come to Jesus through faith, your relationship with God is fully functional in peace. It's good. But that experience, and this is where I want to go today, that experience shouldn't happen in a vacuum. It should begin to move out towards your human relationships. When I experience his forgiveness and his love and his patience with me, that should be doing something towards those around me. Amen? Come on, you got to help me, 1130. You guys are awake. Shout amen every now and then, okay? As a matter of fact, I would say if we sit in church and we sing and, and we read the Bible and we hear all about this amazing relationship we have with God, and yet it's not doing something to human relationships, we got to think about what's going on there. So I'm very excited about this. Um, it's fitting going into Martin Luther King Jr. weekends as well. And his, his battle, he gave his life uh, for equality and relationships. And I love relationships. I'm kind of an, kind of an extra, extrovert. But uh, from, from life's earliest stages, you are in relationships. We, at our 10 o'clock service, we had like 18 newborns in our, in our service. I know, it's awesome. It's like, yeah, go babies. Um, but if you think about the relationship that that newborn has with a mother, it's unending. And then when you die, we had uh, several wonderful people go back to the States uh, this week because they lost loved ones. And they're gonna, they were there at the end of a loved one's life. So you can book in life by saying, we are made for relationships from cradle to the grave. But somewhere in between, we kind of mess it up. We are still made to be in relationship with people. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in, a, 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 in Sparta uh, is where I grew up. Um, 
I learned to communicate with my fists, like literally. But even back then, like I realized the importance of relationships. When I would get my, in trouble, I would call my 82nd Airborne brothers, and they would fix things for me. Um, but even back then with sports and, and even the little gang I ran with, I still knew how important relationships were even back then. We're made for them, and they're designed to be beautiful. I remember I met this cute girl who's watching your kids right now, I think, or she may be in here. That's my wife, just to clarify. Um, but uh, I remember when I first met her, I, I tried to do the solo thing because I, I didn't want to deal with people. And then I realized I was not whole, so I met this girl, and I fell in love with her. And I, I love my relationship. I love my relationship with you guys. I have so many great friends. You guys are my friends. And uh, I'm a big C.S. Lewis guy, and I love what he says about why we need relationships. Check this out right here. Lewis goes, in each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. You see, my wife brought out love. I didn't really know how to love until I met her. I kept everything internalized. I was a tough kid. Uh, my wife also taught me how to forgive, as I taught her, as we would screw things up. Um, but it took a relationship to bring that out. I got friends and brothers. They teach me courage. There are times when I'm alone and I get scared. I, I don't think I can do these crazy things <laughs> that God puts on my heart. And then I get my brothers, my friends around me, and they say, John, you can do this. Go conquer that thing. But it is only through these, these relationships that they bring forth the whole me. Amen? So we need these things. But... But when you look in the news, what in the world is going on with relationships? There's so much bad news with relationships. I, I, was, I was cruising the, the news, I think BBC and USA and Fox, and if, if, if your days are going well, you can ruin it right there. I'm telling you the truth. But uh, these are the news headlines that I, I ran across. Think of relationships. Of course, Trump impeachment in our political mess. Our political relationship has never been divided with Democrats and Republicans, like today, never. I'm a big U.S. history buff, never. I, I saw another headline, Trump attacks Apple. I have no idea what that's about. Like, Apple just gave us three cameras in a phone, okay? Like, what, what do you attack? Like, there's nothing to attack. But I seriously, I read that, Trump attacks Apple. And then uh, on the Democratic side, of course, with some of the new debates going on, in the Democratic Party, Warren feuding with Bernie Sanders to the point that they're like, there needs mediation in this. It's like seventh grade stuff. And, and the relationship is just like weird. It's not even professional between these potential candidates. Um, and, and, you know, if, if your world was going well, here it stops. Harry and Meghan have left their responsibilities <laughs> with the crown. I don't even know what those responsibilities are. You go to Wimbledon if, if you're royalty and kind of hang out. But, but there's this great schism. They're being attacked for, like, running to Canada now. Apparently that wasn't cool. Of course, in all seriousness with Syria and all that's going on there with other nations, including ours, but also just internally. Um, they're warring with th themselves. And there's just so much going on in the different layers of relationships there. I, I read this one. This is kind of crazy. The millennials in Japan. Japan is very much, I, I love Asian culture. Um, Japan is very much a communal place. Um, even if it's an honor culture, it is very much communal. Families stay together. And now the new thing with millennials is the solo generation. That's what they're calling it. And it was a little funny because there were pictures of, um, like, I'm, I'm sorry if you love karaoke. Forgive me, but I think karaoke is really lame. I'm just saying. If you love it, I love you. <laughs> and it's really because I can't sing, okay? But now the new thing with millennials is, is they're singing karaoke alone, that's a whole new low, okay, when you're singing karaoke alone. But it's just because they don't want to deal with people. Um, I was reading about Twitter. When, when, when people start tweeting about Twitter, you have a problem. Um, apparently, the, the, those on the board of Twitter allowed certain hate ads to be tweeted, but not other ads. They didn't want to take shots at people, so they allowed groups to take shots through tweets. And now they've come back realizing they're being attacked for this. And they've come out with a public apology. So even social media and the conflict. My point is, guys, um, is it the Golden Globes? Are the Golden Globes coming up? I said the Oscars. I love being in Germany. I'm totally out of touch. Is it the Golden Globes? Raise your hands if you're... Uh, is it the Oscars? The 10 o'clock said the Golden Globes. I think this is the sharper crowd. <laughs> so you don't tell them I said that. 
But now there's, there's the Oscar snaps. You know what I'm saying? It's not even about who the best actress is anymore. It's about like, yeah, but it was unfair because, you know, you got to... It's just a total, can I, can I say what you've been trying to say and you want to say? It's a total mess out there, guys. It is a total mess. I have no problem pointing at the elephant in the room. Our relational system in our world right now is in absolute shambles. And if you're unbothered by any of this, starting with the Oscars, which I am totally unbothered by, you are, you are ignorant. That's, that's what they say. You are ignorant if you don't care about all these relational divides. And I don't care about most of them. I, that's not me being insensitive. It's just I don't think our world goes forward this way. I think there's, there's entirely different strategies to moving our world forward. Now, I will also say that I believe some of this needed to happen. We needed someone to bulldoze the way we're looking at certain issues in our world, certain relational issues of race and gender and things like that. Um, I'm a big backer of, of females. I watch my mom. I, I get choked up. I, man, this woman keeps doing this to me. I watch, she's my hero. I watched her raise five really bad kids, <laughs> like really bad kids. Um, and I watched her deal with my dad. And uh, she is a warrior's warrior, this woman. And so every ounce of me, you know, I, I love to fight for, for women, and I, I, I still talk to my mom, and I go like this, like, Ma, you, you, in your lifetime, you actually, it was illegal for you to vote. Like, I can't get my mind around that stuff. Um, so I'm for a lot of these relational jars and, and crashes and fights, because I think we did need to adjust some things in our world. But I'm with Martin Luther. We are like a junk man. We fall off one side of the horse. We get back on. We fall off the other. We have so gone to the extreme on how to deal with each other as human beings right now. No, everyone's in paralysis. We don't know what to do. We don't know who's going to tweet about what we said. Um, teenagers, I, I feel like I'm speaking to teenagers today because I got your back, you guys. Um, and parents, I got your back. It's like, you know, I talk to teenagers every Sunday down here. They're my friends down here. And, and they tell me, like, I don't even know what to do in school anymore. I don't know what I can say. I don't know what I can believe. I don't know if I can be a Christian because it's so hostile. Like, you don't even know what you can say anymore. Yet, you know, we are supposed to have freedom of speech. Yet, you know, I, it's, it's a very crazy thing. Couples, young adults. Of course, many of our people are in leadership here. And, and leading has, has never been harder before because you don't know what you can do. You don't know the capacity you have to actually lead another human being. It's a wild world. There, there are a few new sayings that I think started in about 2015. I'm going to jump to Philippians 2 in just a minute, but I want to unpack this. Um, we have birthed new terms. Please don't laugh when I say these. I mean that because I think some of these needed to happen. And if you think I'm unqualified to, to speak about relationships and how they're altered in the world, I grew up in Seattle. Um, the home of liberalism. And I'm not saying I'm conservative or liberal at all. I'm saying I'm a Jesus follower. But what I am saying is I understand this world. I spent the last 12 years in California in the belly of the beast. And I spent the last four years in San Francisco where they birthed it all in some factory, I'm telling you. So I understand this world and I understand this fight. And so now we have birthed terms because we just don't know what to do anymore such as safe space, I am for safe spaces. I am totally for safe spaces. And I think a lot of this needed to happen. There were workplaces that were not healthy. And people could not, you know, talk. They couldn't speak about their workplace. There were, there were homes that were not healthy. And it was not a safe space to be yourself. And, and tell someone, like, I don't like what's happening here. So there, a lot of this needed to happen. A lot of this needed to happen. But we have gone so far, it's like a mechanism for power now. And I know you, you can't say it. I'm going to say it for you. We'll tweet this. It is a mechanism of power. It's being used the wrong way. It's like this. Like a boss comes to an employee and they go like this. Hey, I need to talk to you. You know, I'm really happy you're here, but I want to talk to you about your performance. And right away, all you got to say is, this is not a safe space for me. I can tell you where a safer place is. It's down at Wendy's. No, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Stop it. I'm kidding. I'm just testing your love today. And again, I want to I keep saying I think we needed to alter certain environments so there were safer places for us to be human. 
but we have gone so overboard with these things. I think a lot of the times, not here, but what I experienced in California is parents didn't know how to raise their kids because their kids were actually like a 14-year-old, like, hey, I need you home on time. And literally, teenagers were saying, I don't feel like my home's a safe space anymore. Microaggression. I'm not for aggression. Now, sometimes aggression needs to happen. We understand that. You understand that. In many of your fields, we know that. But now we got a term called microaggression, and uh, I don't think aggression belongs in certain areas at all. But we have a microaggression terminology now that says, the moment I even sense the smallest form of challenging, it's not a safe space anymore. Your, your world can't work this way. Some of this needed to happen. That's the 18th time I've said that. I don't want to be taken wrong today. And I want you to tweet it. But we have gone so far that we don't know how to relate to one another because everyone thinks they're assaulting everyone now. It's good, but it's been taken too far. And as a pastor, I just want to start over. If you're here and you're a teenager, you're a parent, you're like, man, my relationship's gotten screwed up, or you're married, and you're just like, I got all these messages going through my mind on how I'm supposed to treat people and what I'm not supposed to say, what I'm supposed to say, I want to help you start over a little bit today. I want to give you good news that Jesus actually gives you a revolutionary and radical way on how to have relationships in this world, and it is beautiful stuff. In 1967, long before my time, I just want to say that, I can't say that much longer. Martin Luther King Jr. had a speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? And I, I think that's where our world is at right now. Relationally, we're going, where do we go from here? I don't think we anticipated, nor are we ready to deal with social media. Because certain things can be tweeted, and there's no regulatory board that deals with it if it's alive. You are, your avatar literally is stuck with that image now. And anybody can pull up something on you, a lie on you or whatever. And we are now just starting to backtrack and say, how do we regulate social media because people's lives are being ruined? Well, I love the good news. We can, we can say we're putting that all on the shelf. And the gospel gives us a new way to relate to one another in this church, in our homes, at the workplace. And I just want to start over. I want to unpack it for you if you're struggling where to go with a relationship. So I'm going to give you one point, and then we're going to dive into Philippians 4. Are you guys still good? I wasn't too aggressive, was I? Okay. Because this is a safe space. Okay, write this down, or, or uh, let's have some fun with this. I want you to loosen up, relax. Um, take a picture of this point, and I want you to pray about this. I want you to think about this. Here's where Jesus starts this. He's like, if you, any capacity, any, any relationship you have, here's, here's the only way a relationship can be healthy. And I, that's a bold statement, but I believe the only way. We need to come down and get into the skin of others if we're going to truly relate with one another. I'll explain what I mean. We need to, those are the two moves, the supernatural moves of God, we need to come down, and then we need to move into the skin of each other. And this was a hard lesson for me when I became a Jesus follower because I was, I was raised so rough. Like you, the last man standing was right. You just fought. I remember, like I literally remember coming over the, the dinner table the few times we had a family dinner at my brother. Can you imagine that? Like this 12-year-old just like coming across the mashed potatoes because we had a dis. I won, by the way, um, and I'm the youngest. But I, I literally had a disagreement with my brother, and I just came over the top of the table. So when I became a Jesus follower, and I started reading these things in the words of Jesus, they were so radical to me. I'm like, well, if I disagree with someone, how can I still like them? <laughs> like, duh. Of course you can still like them. So this may be like doing 120 on the Autobahn and kicking it in reverse for some of you. It was for me. But let's journey together, okay? Let's, let's figure this out together. Philippians, actually, let's go to Philippians chapter 4, and let me show you what's going on in this church. I feel like my, did my stand fall again? Can you come up here and hold it while I preach? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing, don't. I'm just teasing. That's microaggression right there. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. If it falls, pretend it didn't. Just keep your eyes on me. So let me just say this, because we are human beings, and this is just more of a talk today than a sermon, we all have a preferred way of experiencing life. Is that right? I mean, humor and ideologies and belief systems 
and just the way you conduct your home. Um, God never says that it's all going to be cookie cut. He gives us this freedom and liberty to be us within his ways, within his ways, okay? But we are very much individual people. I'm not going to do the weird snowflake thing that we're all different. That's how just like weird now. But here's where I'm concerned from, from the influence of the world. Our disagreements can turn hostile. And, and I don't, that's what we're not, that's what we need to relook at. Why, if I disagree with you, must you be my enemy now? Now, sometimes it has to go to that level. That's why we have a government and so forth. I get that. I get that. I'm talking personally. If, if it's my brother-in-law um, and he has a different mindset on a political issue or he has a different mindset on who should have won the best actor for the Oscars or even about religion, why does he have to be my enemy? Why does he have to be my enemy? Now, the cool thing is this is actually not new. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and look at verse 2. Um, this has been going on for a couple thousand years. So if you grew up in church and I said to you, what is the book of Philippians about? What would you tell me? It's the book of? It's the book of joy. Okay, okay, that's fine. Keep that. It's not, it's, it kind of is. It's the book of relationships. It's the book of relationships. Paul writes a letter to the Philippian church because the teenagers are fighting with their parents. The women are fighting with the women. The dudes are fighting with the dudes. The political stance over here is fighting with this political stance. It's a book of broken relationships and how to put them back together. So when you go back in and read Philippians, I want you to see that. Look at Philippians 4 too. Check it out. Here, here it is. Those are two women. That's not being sexist. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Um, I'm sure you could have put like 10 guys on here, but they all went to the men's retreat. So he says, I entreat Yodia, that's a, a lady, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. What does that tell us? They're disagreeing. Good. You guys are ready. I'm good. Good. They're, they're fighting over something, and you say, like, what's going on? Now, they're not just disagreeing. Like, I disagree with some things we do here. I disagree with some things that we do in my home. I disagree with some of the things that our staff does here, and I lead our staff. Not everything is my way, because not everything is right that I believe. That should be okay, but what happened in this church, and it doesn't have to, nothing's going on in our church, um, but this could also be your home or your workplace or just your friendships, is they took it to an extreme level. These ladies disagreed, and they began to war with each other on a disagreement. Instead of saying, well, I still love you. You know, you can be wrong. <laughs> um, you know, if you're wrong, or if you think that way, that's fine. But I can still treat you like a human. My point is, guys, in our world today, what we're doing is, is we're not treating each other human when we disagree. We're, we're finding vicious attacks. And just as a church, it's my responsibility to make sure we're not moving that way as the world moves that way. You say, what were they fighting over? Well, look at Philippians 2 and verse 3. Check this out. He goes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceits. Now, there's two things happening there. Selfish ambition is your own personal stance on something. Like, I believe this, or I don't think you should do this. That's selfish ambition. And so you go like this. I won't, I won't be in a relationship with you until you submit to, to, to the way I think this should be done. I refuse to be in a relationship with you until you submit to the way I, I think this should be done. And then when he says, don't do that or don't be full of conceit, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a political word. It means your group. So apparently in the church, someone's going like this. I don't, I don't, think, uh, I don't think the pastor should be doing that. No one would ever say that here. I don't think the pastor should be doing that. And then they go like this. They say, hey, did you, see what the, did you see what they did over there? And they start creating a crowd. Now, the pastor over here, he, he hears about it, and he starts to get a crowd over here. He goes, you see what they're saying over here? Now, Paul's, th Paul's like this. He's like this. Why do we have to live in a world where just because we disagree, we've got to fight? I don't even mind a narrative. Let's get together and talk about it, but we don't have to lose grace and love. And again, that was hard for me to, to reprogram my mind when I became a Christ follower because it was just a whole lot easier getting into a circle and fighting. Especially when you win all the time. <laughs> then Jesus humbled me. <laughs> so in our world, guys, not, not totally, but it's growing. The new narrative is that people only have to treat each other kindly. When that person yields to my agenda, my idea, or my cause. 
If they are not aligning with me, I have the green light to be hostile towards them. And that just is not the way of Jesus Christ. And that's going to screw up a lot of relationships in, in our lives if we don't see the way of Jesus. And I think it's like a new empowerment almost. I, I don't, I'm still, sociologists don't even understand what's going on right now in our world. It's moving so fast. It's like a new empowerment. We go like this. We find a cause, and this is not to hurt anybody, but we find a cause, and we go like this. I believe this, and it may be a perfectly good cause. The Bible's going to say that. That's okay. Believe it. Fight for it. But we go like this. We make it bigger than it really is, than it really matters. We grow it because it gives some type of self-importance. I believe in this thing, and it gives me a purpose to live. And then what we do is we go like this. If you want to be in a relationship with me, what you need to do is you need to conform to all of this. I said 100%. You got to just conform to this thing. And that creates all this tension because a lot of people yield and they, they bow down even though they don't, they don't believe in that thing. They're just trying to keep the relationship together and not be attacked. And the, the actual word Paul uses in the Bible is for pride is to inflate beyond its normal size. So he goes like this. The world is teaching us to inflate certain things beyond their normal size. And what we're saying is you got to get by it and on my side for us to have a relationship. And let me just illustrate. I have here a balloon. And I'll show you exactly what the Bible says here in a minute. Here's what Paul is saying. This is my cause. It could be a good cause. It could be a worthy cause. But I'm going to blow it up bigger than it really needs to be. And I'm going to allow it to govern me. If I pass out, I took a seven-hour CPR class to get my driver's license on Friday. This is my cause. It really should be like this big. It's a good cause. The world needs it. But I'm making it bigger than it is because it makes me feel empowered. Now, if I want to be in a relationship with you, um, here's what I got to do. I got to move close to you. But you know what it's like when you're around people and the, they always throw their cause in your face? Don't hit me or nothing, okay? <laughs> so, I, you know, I come over for dinner. I'm like, yeah, so it's good to see you. So what do you believe about? <laughs> now, what happens when you get these causes bigger than they need to be? Your soul starts feeling like it's going to explode. In the environment, he's starting to lean his head a little bit. <laughs> but see, that's what the world looks like. We're all kind of walking around like this. Because there's so many people that have these inflated causes. They're not wrong. They're just so big. It's like... Everyone's walking on eggshells. We're like, dang. And it's like this. Hey, I'm sorry. This is what I believe. If you want to relate to me in any way, you better get by this thing. You better come on my side of this thing. And it's really creating chaos in our world. You come on my side. You come over here, and I'll relate to you. Jesus does this awesome thing. He goes like this. Nah. How about I enter your side? How about I move the opposite way? And we'll change everything. So here's how Jesus says to have a relationship. And if you're here like me and you've got certain relationships, maybe it's a marriage or a friendship or whatever, a coworker, and you're like, yeah, I've really demanded. This is awkward. <laughs> I've really demanded, like, man, until you, until you change that thing and until you get on my side 100%, I'm sorry, there's, we're distancing ourselves. Paul just comes in and he goes like this. I just need you to see a different way. Here's, here's how you can repair relationships. And I want you to actually write this down. I love this thought. This governs all of my relationships. I don't always do it. I, I screw it up a lot. But I want you to write this down. The first thing we've got to do is we have got to get in the skin of people. We got to get into the skin of people. Yeah, take a picture of it. Seriously. Get in the, get in the skin of people. Tweet that bad boy. Instead of going like this. Instead of saying, you got to come over to my side, Paul goes like this. If you want to truly build a real relationship, you've got to come into their life. You've got to get into their skin. You've got to feel what they, they feel. You've got, you got to understand their story. And I was thinking about this, and this is not to make anybody feel embarrassed, but, you know, if you've got teenagers, you've got to understand their story. It's a weird story. <laughs> I love you teens, but, you know, you've got to get into their skin. We've got to slow down long enough and come down and say, what is their journey like? And teenagers, you got to get into your parents' story because it is not easy. you got to sit in their skin for a while when you want certain liberties. And you got to feel what they must feel. It's not easy. 
And if you're a boss, the Bible teaches us, I'm a boss. We have a big staff here. Um, I am constantly trying to practice, like, this, this employee's doing this over here. But I got, instead of just going, why are you doing that? Get on my side. Get over here and do it. I got to go like this. I got to get in your skin. I got to feel what you feel. Because maybe all hell broke loose at home today. And maybe that's why you're doing that. Maybe you don't even know you're doing it. But things are so screwed up right now. And if I slow down long enough and I begin to feel what you feel and process that or even get into a conversation with you, this is how my wife and I grew close. I didn't know how to do this when I met this girl because we were just partying like crazy. And then we became Jesus followers and, and I didn't know how to deal with certain emotions and I had to learn like how to get in my wife's skin to feel what she was feeling day in and day out. And, and it took like conversations and it was really awkward. It was like, just can I talk to you? Like, I'm, you know, explain to me these things and how are you feeling or, or just normal walks and conversations of her unpacking her, her dreams, her fears, what she had gone through. And it, the more I felt her, the more my heart would move towards compassion towards her. And when two people are getting in each other's skin and the heart is being moved with compassion because you understand their journey that is when relationships become real and it's only when I mean this it's only when you feel someone's journey and I mean feel it that you can move towards them forming a relationship you guys okay look at Philippians 2 look at verse Look at verse 3. Let me go through it again. Watch what he does here, and I'm going to wrap this. I've been, I've been long all day. I don't know what's going on. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Quit trying to pull everybody to your side and pull everybody. It's okay to believe things, but you can't be in a relationship when they believe exactly like you, when they, when they do exactly like you. But in humility, like, there's more to this world than just your cause. Count others more significance than yourselves, which is to say they've got a journey too. They've got... They've got They've got ideas too. They've got things going on in their head too. I've got to learn those things. That's what Paul's telling us. And then he goes like this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he goes through this weird thing like Jesus came to the earth. Came to the earth and we're all like, what does that have to do with us fighting? He says, you've got to learn what Jesus did. Now watch what I'm, watch what I'm about to do. Jesus Christ was in heaven. He didn't understand what it was like to live in anxiety. He didn't understand what it, was to, what it was like to be tempted to be fearful. He didn't, he didn't even understand what it was like to be tempted with sin. He was in heaven. How could he have a relationship with us if he could not feel us? And so he came down and he got into our skin and became one of us to feel every ounce of what we feel until God's heart was moved towards us and that's when our relationship with, with him was birthed. And that's why Paul lays this out. Look at verse 5. He goes, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here's what Jesus did to build a relationship with us. This is how we got to build a relationship with each other. Who, though he was in the form of God, like he was right, guys. His ideas are right. He doesn't even got to tweet them. We're just wrong down here. But he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. I'm not going down there and talking to them. I'm right. No, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and women. He took on flesh. He took on emotions. He took on us. He walked in our skin and he felt us. And the Bible says constantly that his heart was moved when he felt what we felt. I love that. I'm, I'm working on that. There's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy goes like this. That must be hard. Peace. Empathy, empathy goes like this. That must be hard. I'm coming. I'm entering your story. I'm going to feel what you feel. And we're going to get out of it together. Write this down. When someone experiences that from you, empathy gives you currency. It is baffling to see someone get into your story and care for you. It is baffling. Why do you love me like this? And the cool thing is it opens the heart to trust 
and even change. We want to change people. I, I want to change people. I want people to know Jesus and know his ways and, and align with his ways, but it's going to take empathy first. They need to know I care for them first. They need to know I understand them first, and then they will give me their ear. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. The kids are fired up. Are you, are you fired up? <laughs> Let me tell you a quick story, then I'll shut this down. I, I did. I took a seven-hour uh, first aid class on Friday. Can I get like some sympathy or empathy here? <laughs> and it was seven hours. So like if you, seriously, like if you have a cramp in your arm and you're driving, I'm your guy. <laughs> I know every move now. It's amazing. Um, but the, it was all Germans and then these three Americans. And the thing was in German. So you're actually in trouble if we're driving together and you get in trouble because I have no idea what to do. But actually, we have this, we have an awesome neighborhood. We have a, a lady, her name is Anya. Many of you know her. She's a part of our church. She lives down the road from me. She went with us and translated three hours of this thing. I know, right? That's empathy. It could have been sympathy, like, dude, good luck. <laughs> but she was empathetic, and it was really cool. But you know what? You can only do that for three hours, so she bounced. <laughs> she only loves us so much, okay? <laughs> But the cool thing was, there's these three Americans, and German people have been so nice to us. It's amazing. I'm serious. And, uh, and they're speaking German, and they're going through this stuff, and everyone's glancing at us like, they're lost right now. They're lost. And then we had to go, like, do the things, and he's yelling at me, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It's a, it's a dummy. He's never even been alive, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, we were sitting in this half circle. Like, it felt like an AA meeting. It really did. It was just this crazy experience. And this German guy next to me kept glancing at me. Because, like, I was sweating. And he's glancing at me, he's glancing at me, he's glancing at me. And I could tell, you know what he was doing, you guys? He was getting in my skin. He was slowing down long enough, and you could see him processing, what is it like right now to be that family? Uh, it, well, it's lame. That's what it's like. <laughs> it's embarrassing. And, and you know what he did? We had a break after four hours. And uh, this guy slid over, and he goes, hey, I speak English. And I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> but uh, he goes, I speak English. Do you want, do you want me to translate for you? I, he may be here right now. I don't even know. Um, and, and we're like, yes. And he starts translating, and I actually felt like I was a part of the group. And so the, we had another break after like 10 more hours, and then <laughs> I... He got into my story, and it so touched my heart that he was willing to do this that I got into his story. I'm like, what's your name? Where are you from? And he's telling me a story. I live in K-Town trying to move. I got an eight-year-old son, and I just, I, I could feel him. I could feel his story, his, his dreams, his heartaches. I just felt him. Do you know, in, in the matter of a couple of hours, I had built a relationship. My family built a relationship with this man because we both chose to enter each other's stories, get into each other's skin, feel what we feel until our hearts were moved with compassion. And next thing I know, my wife's like, you should come to Frontline. <laughs> and I don't know if he knows Jesus, but I'm going to tell you what, that is a beautiful beginning to know that people love him. And we just don't want to bring you into a belief system, but we love you enough that we want you to know the love of our God. And that's really what Romans 2, 4 says. Go ahead and throw that last slide up for me. This is what God does. This is his mode. This is how he builds relationships. You say, how does God build relationships? Uh, Romans 2, 4. Here's how God builds relationships. Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Like when you hear that he loves you and he cares for you and he, un he understands you and he sent his son to feel every ounce of what you feel, doesn't that make you turn an ear to him and say, then, then I want this. I want to move towards him. That's how I got saved. That, that is God's way to have relationships. Now, I know this is not easy because many of people have come to me today and they have said, I have tried to be empathetic. I've tried to get into the skin of someone and they have not reciprocated. And we're going to deal with that. But for, t for now, for now, here's all I want to leave with it. Jesus had a decision to make. He could have either maintained his place at the top, knowing he was right and had no relationship with you. Or he could have stepped down, not letting go of his beliefs. But he could have stepped down, 
gotten into your skin, felt what you feel, until his heart was moved towards you so he could heal you and be in, in a relationship with you. But he could not have done both, and neither can we. Let's go back to God's design for gospel relationships. Amen? Let's pray. And I don't know if God has brought a face to your mind, a person to your mind. It's, it's okay. It's good. I know this whole week he's brought people to mind that I have, I have told them, as soon as you align with me, I will move close to you. And if God has brought someone to your mind, even if they're sitting with you, it's, t it's so okay. It's so okay. Will you with me just get back to this? Yes, we want each other to change. We're moving towards that way. But can we not still be kind and love each other? And if God has brought someone to your mind, even if you're a teenager in this room, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a friend, can you slow down right now and just get into their skin? Maybe they've been the way they are because life is, is living hell. Maybe they've been through some things. And yes, we want them to change. But if we can get into their skin right now and feel their journey, will it not at least breed compassion and patience? Let's make that supernatural move right now to get into each other's skin. Father, we want beautiful relationships. In a world at war, I pray you keep the war from our homes and the war from our, our friends and that you would teach us this way, Father, that we would divorce the, the message of the world that tells us how to relate to one another and we would come down off of our thrones, move into each other's skin, feel what we feel and love Father, I'm praying for that in my own heart. I pray you birth that spirit over this entire place today. In Jesus' name, amen.